Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to our event, The Road Beyond Reclosure. Too many hours, but it's all about Omicron and the events in the experiential industry. Uh, we're in the midst of a third wave in India uh, with respect to the Omicron variant. And yet again, we're asking ourselves this question of where does the event industry and the festivals industry go from here? What are the concerns that we are dealing with a third time around? Um, and we're here to talk about everything in this space with you today. My name is Rashmi Dhanwani. I am the founder and CEO of the Artex company. Uh, we're a strategic consultancy that services the culture sector in India in areas of audience development and sector research. Today's session is a part of uh, Festival Connections, which is an annual program of events and a wide ranging network of uh, festival stakeholders that aims to provide access to skill development and opportunities for exchanges relevant to the festivals and the cultural sector in India and South Asia. The program is initiated and supported by the British Council in India and has been for the last three years in partnership with Arts and Culture Resources India. We'll hear more about uh, on the learnings for this multi-year project and the uh, Council's work in the field shortly when I introduce Jonathan, who is the Director of uh, British Council in, in, a, in a short while. But let me first give you a sense of um, what is it that we'll be discussing today before we um, move on to talk about our work in this space. Um, the festival and events in the experiential industry has been obviously one of the worst affected since the outbreak of COVID-19 in 2020. Um, as some of you know, um, we've had the sector recover, do a few events, and then be dealt with a blow of another wave, which happened in the UK in the last quarter and right now in India in this present quarter. Just as we are coming back into a positive rebound, businesses are again facing the impact of another wave of disruptions, postponements, and cancellations, mainly because of the contagious Omicron variant, even though it appears to be less severe in terms of the impact and the contagiousness of this particular variant, it does impact health and safety standards and how we are allowed to, allowed to operate. Uh, how does this specifically affect the festival sector and the culture sector uh, across both countries? Let's, let's talk about how big the sector is first and how many people are involved in this space. In India, uh, we're talking about the live events and entertainment sector of which festivals um, is, is, is a part. Uh, it's close to five lakh crores in terms of, uh, of the size. And uh, it includes both the organized and unorganized sector. And it employs about 10 million people across all verticals. In the UK, this is a 70 billion pound industry employing around 700,000 people. Uh, when the first wave hit us in 2020, in early 2020, almost 100% of the events across the world were canceled or postponed some of whom were able to move to digital formats, some of whom said we'll wait and watch. So it's taken time for the sector to come back um, into action. Um, events and festivals, because it's typically seen as leisure, um, is normally the last sector to be given permission to open up. And this is the third time in two years that the sector across India and UK has faced a complete shutdown. Uh, and, and again, sorry, just normally we don't start off our events at, at such a gloomy note, but it's, it's uh, you know, it's the third time that this is happening. So by this time, we feel that uh, there should be some guidelines, some support, at the very least, some sort of a pathway for us to allow us to plan amidst these repeated waves. So what does that sustainability plan look like is, is something we are hoping to um, uh, sort of at least at the very least discuss in the session. Um, I think the first week of Jan, at least in India, when story every day we heard about three, four festivals being canceled, we quickly reached out to uh, industry leaders, all of whom are on the panel, and literally within seconds, all of them graciously agreed to come here and talk to us about what is now, we think is of course a very timely session that will identify practical action and immediate support available to festival and events organizations. And what are the possibilities that we can think about when, it's, when it comes to public experiences around these uh, various variants or the future of public experiences, community celebrations, and cultural life. Um, before we move on to talk about uh, this particular session and introduce our panelists, I'd love to invite Jonathan Kennedy, who's the Director of Arts at British Council India. Uh, and, and just to give you a sense of the wonderful work that the British Council has been doing, of course, over decades, but particularly in the last two years since we've been hit by the pandemic and the kind of reorientation of some of the uh, work into thinking about what the future of cultural work looks like. With that, uh, Jonathan, inviting you to 
share a little bit about the council's work with us. Thanks so much, Rashmi. And uh, there's a little presentation, so we'll cut to the presentation straight away. There we go. Thank you very much. That's terrific. So our, our programme in festivals, we broadly co co called festivals for the future. And it's really been around strengthening the creative economy of India's arts and culture festivals. We'll go to the next screen. And the reason why we landed on, on festivals as one of our multi-year programmes between the UK and, and India, in part because India has such an enormous number of established and emerging arts festivals across the country and across art forms, and that part of our work in is to sustain that, or was to sustain that, um, because of its scalability. And because we also know that from the UK perspective, there's enormous amount of expertise that sits within higher education in um, arts management and culture policy and festivals, and also from the international festival sector in particular, including Manchester, Edinburgh, London, and Belfast. So that our programme is looking to work across India and across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Our research, with the Artex company and Fiki on the impact of COVID-19 in the past couple of years has also confirmed that the bulk of the arts and culture sector, including festivals, are MSMEs, micro, small and mid-sized enterprises. That's effectively workforces of less than 50 at mid-scale, fewer than 20, at small scale and fewer than 10 at micro scale. And they form the majority of the sector in India, which also means in terms of small and micro, there's a huge amount of risk. The small companies who've been established for less than five years don't build up big cash reserves. They're still getting established. And when the growth of the festival sector, which have been about 17%, in advance of the pandemic hit, it all, we also knew this meant risk to the arts festival sector in India because of the pandemic and the festivals just having to stop or close down or postpone or go online. Uh, we'll move to the next, next screen. Our program therefore has many, it's kind of holistic, it has many aspects to it festivals, connections, of which this is one, which is a kind of networking, experience sharing platform that we've been running with um, Artex for the past couple of years now. South Asia Festivals Academy, of which I'll talk shortly. Festival Partnership, which is bringing festivals between countries together to collaborate, research into festivals and their value to the creative economy in certain states and parts of India and a Festivals from India portal that we'll be launching in March of this year, which will be unique in terms of profiling festivals from India to India and to the UK. And all of our work in the skills programs with Festival Connections and the Academy and networks we've established will all be on the platform, as well as attracting new relationships with the UK and India as part of what the platform will enable by way of profiling and showcasing. Um, I think we'll move on to the next screen, except to say that, of course, this year is India's 75th anniversary of independence. And we are working with the Foreign Office and the Government of India on a big bilateral arts and culture season, India, UK together. And a key part of that program will be our work with festivals. And festivals connections with uh, Rashmi and the Artex team have had several thematics. And when COVID first hit in March, 2020, we moved from what, what had previously been across India in rooms, all online. And we ensured that each session was absolutely relevant to the need of the hour. So in March, when everything went into lockdown, we did sessions on how to manage your cash flow when suddenly you have either no income 
or your festival is cancelled. So how, what do you do to manage your organization's sustainability in the sharp end of a crisis? And since then, we've adapted and listened on each occasion to each of the sessions to find out what's going to be useful for the next session to make sure we're responsive and relevant to the moment. So as you can see, we've done lots of sessions, fundraising, digital festivals, international collaboration, inclusion and equalities, youth art festivals, environmental festivals, and so forth, to ensure we are sharing expertise from festivals in India and festivals in the UK. And I'm delighted that we have Tom Sweet, our Petit Council colleague from the music team, who will be sharing ex experience of the music sector and the festival sector as part of this session today. And we'll move on to the next screen. Ah, and then this is a new, a new innovation, and maybe this is best if I hand just for this moment back to Rashmi. If not, I'll, I'll keep going, no problem. I'll keep going, because this, this will be launching over these next few months will enable internships between festivals in India and the UK, so that we can broaden out the relationships, deepen them, and build those structural relationships that will then sustain the programme beyond our work at British Council. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. And our South Asia Festivals Academy started in Goa, face to face, before the pandemic, then had a, a version in Guwahati, and then we had the pandemic and we had to move the whole programme online. And to some extent, it's, it's liberated us because we're now able to expand the program from festivals in India, but actually now across South Asia. And we start next week with our intermediate course for festivals across India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. And the course is now run with tutors from India and the UK, and is formally managed by Edinburgh Lake University, who also now accredit the course as a postgrad or undergrad credits towards another qualification. So it's also got lots of rigor around it. And the value of say the intermediate course is that you leave after the 10 week online distance learning sessions with a business plan that you can then take away and use to drive your festival forward and to sustain it through all of the challenges of COVID, um, let alone climate change. So that's um, the Festival's Academy that we've been running for the past couple of years now. Um, our research, as I've uh, intimated around taking the temperature, is looking at the wider gamut of the creative economy in India. And specifically around festivals, we've worked with the Ministry of Tourism in West Bengal on mapping the creative economy of the Durga Puja Festival. Uh, and that report was, was released last year. And it, in terms of the key pieces of data, the festival which runs from five to 10 days within, within the state, as colleagues will know on our, on our call now, and across Calcutta in particular, generates 3.3 crore rupees a year of income generated as part of the festival which about 2.59% of GDP in West Bengal. So it's a major driver of artistic exchange, international relations, cultural tourism, and artists and livelihoods benefit enormously from the festival. Um, and we'll be launching our third round of the Taking the Temperature Research later next month, I think actually in March. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide, thank you very much which is a quick headlines, which will bring all of this work together on one platform. Festivals from India, which we are launching in March and is both centered at the business to business level with workshops, the academy, connections, blogs, uh, all kinds of materials that festivals can turn to, to use and build and learn from each other and with the UK. And then the B2C, the audience facing aspect will profile festivals from all over India to the UK. So you can come and visit, book your flights, 
come to India and attend the festival, including seeing some festivals streamed on the platform as well. I think that's it. On to the final slide. Ah, this is just some of the festivals that we've worked with and had artists performing at um, over the past couple of years. In some cases, face to face, and then the main in the past couple of years online. And on to the next slide, which is our work that we've done with Wales and Northern Ireland and festivals in India in particular. Um, and that's a quick summary of, of that. I'll not get into too much detail there because I'm just conscious of time. And move on to the next slide, which is a kind of call to action. If you're watching online now and you're a festival or a festival goer, you can go onto the Festivals from India platform and either register your festival on there or register as an audience member to go to a festival. And all of our work that we've been doing in festivals is on the British Council page, which is also linked from this screen now. And with that, I'll hand back to Rashmi. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, thanks for that introduction to what British Council has been up to and a call to everyone to sign up for Festivals from India. Um, moving on, I'd love to now invite the panel. I'll, I'll introduce everybody one by one and we can get into the discussion, starting with uh, Mr. Deepak Chaudhary, who's the founder and director of Event FAQs. Um, if anybody has associated with the events industry, you know about Events FAQs in India. And he's also been the founder director of various organizations such as Lakshya Event Capital, and a new organization called XPRNC, uh, reading as Experience Dubai. He is the co-founder of the Whistling Woods International School of Event Management and has recently launched India's first sports and esports school with Whistling Woods. Um, and with Roshan Abbas, who's also on the panel today, he's now in the process of launching the first IP and festival company in Dubai called, as I mentioned, XPRNC, Experience, as well as an event and creative school in Dubai. Uh, we also have Ms. Malvika Banerjee, who is the director of the Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet, as well as the literary meets in Bhubaneswar and Rachi. Her company, Game Plan, uh, is one of India's foremost sports marketing companies, working in this field for more than two decades. She's also a partner at Bailoon, the iconic handlooms, handloom store in Kolkata. We have, of course, uh, Roshad Abbas. He um, wears many hats, uh, but the one that we're referring to today to begin with is the president of uh, EMA Event and Entertainment Management Association, uh, which is an autonomous body of registered companies, institutions, and professionals that operate within India's event and experiential industry. Uh, particularly over the last two years, they've been doing some wonderful work, throwing light on the perils that the events industry has to face and making a case for the industry in, in, in front of various policymakers and governments. Uh, Roshan will tell us more about that shortly. But aside from uh, being the president of EMA, Roshan has been, as you know, a media personality and has co-founded and led several ventures across the spectrum of um, events, festivals. Uh, he runs also a festival uh, called um, Commune and has helped conceptualize, sorry, the company called Commune, and has helped con conceptualize the festival Spoken, uh, bringing together performers from across the world for storytelling, poetry, spoken word, and song. And finally, we have Tom Sweet, uh, who is the music program manager at British Council, and uh, with whom we have, uh, British Council has developed music programs which will be delivered across various countries and have included focus on film, music, creative producers, and the music sector development. Tom has been working in the music industry uh, since several years, starting with a program, uh, with the role of a programmer at the Big Chill Festival in UK and India, and has also established a dynamic year round music program for the Big Chill's uh, London Ventures. Uh, this was followed by contemporary music programming positions at the Barbican and the Warwick Arts Centre in Midlands. Uh, and with that, I'd like to open up the session to all of you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My first theme that we'd love to explore with you is what is the immediate practical action for events and festivals, given the Omicron variant? We know that several festivals, at least in India, have postponed their dates to another two months. Uh, we also know that um, there have been cancellations that have been announced. Um, but maybe the first person that we could call upon here, Roshan, given your position as the president of EMA, what kind of conversations have you been having with the sector and what kind of action, practical action has EMA been taken uh, in order to respond to the variant and the resulting lock lockdown? So thank you, uh, Rashmi, and uh, wonderful to be with everyone on the panel. 
Um, you know, I, I just want to pay just uh, a quick clarification that the 500,000 uh, crores number that we've given uh, in that uh, the wedding sector is perhaps the single largest. So people are looking at it from a festival perspective. If you look at what we call uh, religious and cultural festivals, then that amount would be a much smaller amount. Um, I, again, I mean, we've got some guesstimates on that, which I could share with you all later. Um, but uh, in terms of what you said, this being the third wave, mostly all festivals in India end up happening between November and February, because that's the best time in, in, in most parts of India. And everybody plans festivals at, at that given point in time. We had our own festival. Deepak, I know, had multiple festivals uh, which were going to happen. And uh, in fact, one festival managed to escape Omicron, which was the India Bike Week. So it happened at uh, uh, Ambi Valley with about 3,000 people, I think, coming in. Uh, and one was one of the rare things that managed to happen. But uh, everyone has since then have been having these kind of cancellations. The problem essentially is that uh, there's a lot that goes into putting together a festival in terms of marketing, and that's an expense you've already made. You can obviously push certain elements, but this becomes the key thing. So at EMA, I think our biggest point was to somehow get the government to open and open because for the last two years, uh, we've constantly been saying that this is you know, everyone's conscious is involved and there is this whole thing about lives and livelihood. And you can't swing either way 100%. Uh, there has to be some uh, midway. I, I just shared with you some news where, you know, I just got a message from people saying, the UK is saying that from tomorrow they might, uh, Scotland is clearly saying that they will stop a, lo a lot of the restrictions. Uh, face masks are, uh, you know, restrictions are coming down. Now It's only happening because at some point in time, there are two participants in this. There is the public who, even when the lockdown was announced in uh, Bombay, I remember on Christmas, I was going and it seemed like it was a regular day on Juhu Beach. Nobody cared. So there's a certain amount of immunity that is built within the people. As people who are part of the industry, we have sent out petitions to possibly every state. We, have, we, are, we now have state chapter presidents. And these chapter presidents have, in some cases, been able to meet up with chief ministers. Therefore, in Madhya Pradesh, Himachal, West Bengal, and Uttarakhand, uh, there has been some movement. I know very, very clearly that in Himachal and Madhya Pradesh, they have now come up with a 50% uh, capacity rule, which is what they have done. Now, this is something which we do believe is going to provide some amount of impetus, but the festivals largely take place in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore. So these are states in which we are still having conversations on uh, unofficial levels, we have been told that mid-February things should uh, start opening because this variant has been a little milder in that sense. But but we always get caught in this position. And as EMA, we've reached out to the finance ministry, to INB and to tourism uh, because even today, our industry doesn't have a single you know, department that plays the stakeholder for us, right? I mean, who do we report to? Do we report to... Uh, you know, commerce or finance or INB or, or you know, or tourism. Uh, so, so I think the jury is still out on that. But we've actually been using that to our advantage by approaching all of them and saying, you know, you have to give us some answers. We are getting, uh, honestly, I'll tell you, there are some some good things afoot. Uh, they may not in be able to do something in the short, uh, you know, run, but in the longer run, uh, they will definitely have a lot of. Uh, impact. So do you want me to talk about that just now or uh, I can speak about that later as well if you... No, let's come back to that. I mean, I, I like what you said about this, this balance of lives and livelihoods. So on the one hand, there is a moral responsibility to keep the audiences safe, to keep your artists, your team safe. And on the other hand, it's also about surviving. And I just want to bring in um, Malvika at this point. I mean, you have been in this position where you have to take a call about pushing your festival or holding it, keeping all of these guidelines in mind. Roshan also spoke about certain expenses that are made and that cannot be recouped, like marketing expenses. How did you, did you take the decision of postponing the festival that you are running and, and not postponing? I understand that, that you're doing some of those events digitally, but a majority is going to be in March. So if you could just walk us through uh, the reasons for you or actually at least walk us through how you arrive at the, at the decision that you did to postpone. Uh, and from your perspective, how could you, how did you have to prioritize one over the other and what took a call? So the other festivals might also be able to relate to that kind of decision-making. 
Uh, hi, uh, can everybody hear me? <coughs> yeah, and uh, thanks for having me on this. And, uh, you know, in our pre-event meeting, what I said was, uh, it was very hard for us because we actually anticipated the, the, the strictures that would later come into place. So on the 30th itself, we had a festival that was starting on January 8th in Bhubaneswar. So as you would imagine, hoardings were out. We had sent out invitations, the works, and we had to pull the plug on that. So, uh, you know, the, the tough part for a literature festival, especially, uh, I have another life in sports marketing, which, which has its own dynamics, but a literature festival could technically take place even with 50% attendance, distance, you know, you go through those temperature checks, you can do your RT-PCRs on speakers. You know, it's, it's, it's very hard to explain that uh, at, uh, even without government really telling us that we can't have it, the situation becomes so hemmed in with, you know, 50%. You're scared, you're hearing rising numbers. Most authors are on the wrong side of 60 it's not like you're running a jazz fest or a rock fest where everyone's of a certain age. Here we are dealing with people of a certain vintage. So there are so many other issues that one has to balance. Then you hear that some of the delegates have, in fact, uh, you know, tested positive. So then it all kind, it, it, it just kind of uh, heaps onto your back and you are really pushed to a corner. And uh, that's when you just have to take the call. have corporate uh, sponsorships and partnerships in place. They too don't want the optics, uh, you know, Tata Steel, for instance, has huge uh, interests in Odisha. So they wouldn't want to be seen as that company which is backing an event when the rest of India is, you know, in such a bad way. And Bhubaneswar didn't have those numbers, but at least 75% of our speakers were coming from Delhi, Maharashtra and Kolkata, which were having numbers that, that were galloping in the first week of January. So it's very hard to do this, uh, to answer the part about uh, how does one cope with it? You know, I think going forward in the immediate future, one has to, uh, I mean, come up with this odd verb, unplanned, you know? You have to put aside some money to, of, you know, that, that part of the contract is you just sign blindly force major. We actually have to seriously think about leaving a speaking to our sponsors, speaking to those who are invested in our events and saying, look, this is a situation where we need some flexibility from you. I really, you know, our festival was going into its 10th year in Calcutta and sixth year in uh, Bhubaneswar. So we've been there for a long time. But I really wonder about those festivals which are starting out, which are having their first or second edition, for them to, you know, go to a sponsor and say, look, you know, you have to, uh, you know, underwrite these costs which happened, but, you know, nothing came of it. You know, but that, that rapport comes with time. So uh, that's one. And secondly, we were thinking of other events that we were planning. And this is, I'm sure, true of other people on this panel. Now, I don't feel like doing those events. We were thinking of something in music. We were thinking of something in the Northeast. We just don't have the courage or the, you know, the, the heart to go ahead and start something new till we know where this world of ours is headed. So, and finally, one quick point, we have to manage our own optics. We look like a like beach bathers when a tsunami is coming, you know, events. We are the first thing that's cleaned out, you know. As soon as you hear, oh, this wave is coming, we are the first things to be thrown out of the, you know, the system. So we need to show authorities, audiences that we can manage a situation where things are not ideal and we can still ensure safety and protection and a festival that is not a super spreader. Malvika, thank you so much for that. And, and I completely empathize with what you're feeling. I mean, I think my, my biggest worry is exactly that people like you who are creating festivals and if they are feeling the level of, you know, uh, lack of energy around this uh, in order to, you know, that the creative drive that you need to do it and the worries that are accompanied by this variant, I do hope we're able to, at least through this session, talk through what that means for us and give you more ammo to be able to come back stronger. Uh, but I'd like to bring in Tom here briefly. Uh, Tom, 
the UK, of course, you know, the last two, three months, we've been hearing about what's been happening in the UK, the rising number of cases. Of course, we work very, because we work very closely with British Council, we've been in touch with our colleagues in the UK. And uh, we, we sort of saw what was going on. Uh, but at the same time, you really don't know how the industry is dealing with it or operating. And, and uh, you know, in a pre-talk, you did mention that there were some measures that were put in place to deal with some of these un you know, unplanned shocks. So could you just give us a sense of how the UK's festival scene has adapted or struggled and what kind of measures have been in place that may have supported uh, the sector through this third wave? Thanks, Rashmi, and thanks for having me on the call. It's great to be with everybody on the panel. Um, so yes, in the UK, obviously back in 2020, when the pandemic first broke out, um, everything was hit very quickly and very hard. Um, it was interesting watching the rate at which festivals did cancel and there were some which you just thought, you know, they're leaving it really late and the inevitable came to pass. Um, so I think from memory, 2020 was pretty much a write-off. Um, and as you, as you mentioned earlier, the, 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 the live event sector in its biggest sense in the UK is it's, it's worth 70 billion a year. It employs 700,000 people. Um, so it's a significant sector and contributor to, to the economy. Um, there were lots of cries out for support. Um, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport um, initiated the Cultural Recovery Fund, which is a £2 billion fund um, to help organisations adapt and reshape through the pandemic. That la launched in 2020 and has had several rounds. Um, I think there are still some ongoing. And there was still pressure on to support the festival sector and last summer, summer 21, um, the government announced a scheme, uh, a festivals insurance um, scheme, which would protect people who signed up, um, events that signed up from September 21 through to September 22, um, against full cancellation because of government regulations built in. So, sorry, government regulations being brought in. So. That sounds like a dream, but you know it wouldn't have protected you against things. For instance, say your headliner had had to cancel because someone came down with COVID. It would just be full cancellation of the event. Now, what what that's done is it's given people <coughs> confidence to go ahead and plan. So I think in 2021 we sort of we got the second half of the festival season. I mean, in the UK it's quite long. It starts sort of late May. It runs all the way to, through to mid-ish, late September. I think festival number six might be one of the last outdoor ones along with End of the Road. So I think the second half of festivals took place. They look very different, um, very much UK-based talent because travel was still nigh on impossible, as I'm sure you experienced in India. But I think it, it did help um, you know, give, give local artists a bit of a platform, which they may not have otherwise experienced and I think looking into this year it is giving people hope a number of festivals came on sale you know in their traditional time sort of October November last year it did sell out very very quickly I think the app the, the appetite is there and audiences are really hungry but what is still going on at the minute it feels as you mentioned yesterday the government announced that pretty much all um, COVID regulations have been abandoned you don't have to wear masks in shops and in public transport anymore but what's still going on is artists um, are still having to cancel entire tours because they might book a tour with five dates in the UK, but they might have five dates in Germany, five dates in France. Germany still have far stricter regulations than we do. The German leg of the tour falls apart, the economics of the tour fall apart completely and the whole thing's off. So it's still proving very disruptive, um, even though it does feel touch wood that we're going beyond <laughs> one wave. So I think you know, for, for the sort of May, for the summer period, things hopefully at the minute look a bit more stable. In the immediate term, it's still a bit rocky. Thank you, Tom. I think that's that's great because one of the, aside from the fund that you're talking about in the insurance scheme, I think one of the important points you raised was uh, how these measures give the sector the confidence to replan and move forward. Um, and, and here I'd like to bring in Deepak for a second here. Uh, Deepak, you know, with your work, particularly in the media, asking the questions that you should as the event industry with event FAQs and the work that you're doing currently. Um, what do you think um, is happening in India when it comes to creating these kind of safety nets? What kind of questions uh, should we be asking 
our authorities, the government, what kind of questions are being raised? How can we get this confidence to plan? Uh, you know, the curators don't feel disheartened to organize and run a festival. Uh, what will give them the ammo to get back? Sorry, several big questions, but it seemed like since you've been talking to so many organizations, you may have some strong insights here. Um, so let let actually government bit uh, let in detail. Roshan will have a better hold uh, because he's, he and Ima are interacting with a lot of people at, on a regular basis. Uh, what I feel um, strongly is uh, not too much will other than the regulations of uh, uh, opening and closing. Not too much support is what I see. Government is not aligned to a support. Okay, so where the tax is one, they, we we are a small industry for them. Okay, so it's going to be a challenging piece where where they will uh, really make difference to our lives. Okay, they've they've not done for for these years, uh, but I I strongly feel we we um, I'm saying take opportunities within the business. Okay, so so one part for sure this pandemic has taught us where event managers were not seeing hygiene as the biggest thing. I think that's become it's taught us uh, uh, and and we're moving towards that direction. Um, Content has become a hero. Event content, which was not there, and to a festival, if we talk about festivals, for sure, thirty to forty percent revenue business can come from content, which uh, was not there. And third, and the uh, uh, biggest thing, uh, I strongly feel in person um, will will have more value going forward. Okay, so so for example, uh, a sponsor will value more in person because they have not seen for long. Uh, a ticket buyer will buy a ticket. Okay, so so this this will change. I think what I feel um, to this industry and and these changes will be for good. Yeah, so so that's that's what my perspective to keep um, uh, COVID on one side. Uh, adding to industry's perspective overall, what I feel industry seen a toughest time. I think I was chatting with Fiki the other day, and and we were chatting on the numbers of this year. Um, and the numbers of this year, I said, just copy the number of last year. So it's 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 that sad in the real sense. And we'll see uh, we we're seeing the same cycle, but we'll have to find opportunities. I think there is no uh, at the same time there is no uh, going back on it. We'll have to keep thinking further how to live with this and and keep moving. Thank you, Deepak. One of the things that you brought up in in your response was just how small we are as a sector, and hence. You know, we, we don't have the kind of voice that uh, we are hoping and w w needing from, uh, you know, in, in order to represent ourselves in front of the government. So Roshan, would love to hear from you again. Uh, you briefly mentioned about the kind of impact that Ima's work has uh, made so far, uh, especially when it comes to representations to the government. So if you could just give us a, a sense of what all Ima has done at the moment, and also throw some light on a couple of these initiatives that Tom, not to uh, draw a comparison, but to but to talk about those safety nets, right? What is, how is the is the government listening? Have they come up with anything in response? Um, anything on that perspective, on, on that view would be great. So, so, so see, we, we looked at uh, Rashmi uh, on, at this from three different lenses. One, of course, was that from the last two years, we've been reaching out to the finance ministry before every budget with our set of demands. I know, and initially everybody said, you know, nobody will listen. And I, and I'm a big believer in saying that if you use social media correctly, everybody will listen. And so, uh, when you have 500 members who've got teams, which are large, who are in touch with, I mean, don't forget that a lot of celebrities and well-known people work with the industry. And therefore we sort of use them as well to try and amplify our voice and put these messages out. Um, when these messages went out, we actually were, uh, you know, we also worked with Fiki because Fiki as a body is very, very, uh, you know, close and, and, and uh, with the government knows what's happening. And those conversations actually led to a lot of great work, which is that firstly, the INB ministry held a meeting, which was towards the latter half of last year, where they started having conversations on from various stakeholders of what do they we expect in the next budget. We made, uh, I mean, I think, I think we just, we told them that, you know, we are, we, we are attending the meeting because we're so confused. We don't even know who we report to. And I think uh, the, the secretary found that quite amusing. And then he set up a separate meeting where he said, he said, I'm very embarrassed to realize that, you know, you all are here. And I didn't even know that I, am I meant to represent you? And this actually led to two very good meetings. One that happened with the finance secretary. 
and the finance secretary uh, took some of our uh, demands. Uh, we spoke about incentivizing people doing events within India. We spoke about giving maybe some subsidies to people who were doing them at cultural monuments, etc. And so we put out a whole list of things. They are currently under review. I do believe, I mean, I strongly believe that this year, the finance ministry, either in the finance minister or if all goes well, maybe even to the prime minister's level, there will be some mention of our industry. So this first part of making the invisible visible was key. The second thing is that there is a national film uh, development corporation, as you know, and under that they have formed a single window clearance for all films that are coming to India. And we use that opportunity to say, why can we not have a single window event policy across India? Because a, a large part of our time goes in the facilitation of the 17 to 20 draconian, uh, you know, laws that command, you know, when you've got to get all kinds of permission, local police station, fire, I mean, you name it. Uh, you know, so, so we fought that to a certain degree. And when we raised this, this thing of saying, can we get a single window clearance? Unfortunately, it is a state subject, but we are pushed to say that some elements of it can definitely be at the national level. Uh, it is being looked at, a committee is, has been formed, and uh, this is going to go forward. And again, we hope that we'll be able to at least get some policy level decision on this. The third is that the tourism ministry, uh, uh, again, our past president Sanjoy is an absolute champion of our industry. And you know, he sits on a couple of these committees and he reached out and said, listen, the tourism uh, secretary has turned and spoken about bringing events to India. We immediately, uh, you know, took that uh, opportunity, had a meeting with the tourism secretary where we spoke about the wedding sector at large. We knew that their interest was in that as a sector. And with that, uh, they were extremely impressed with the numbers that we were able to share with them. We, we also feel that the, if, if the wedding sector uh, is allowed to come into the ambit of the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, a, there's incentives. B, there is a lot of, you know, you, again, you can get subsidies, incentives. We can actually have somebody at, a, at an international level in every embassy sitting and talking about India as a destination. And if we are able to achieve that, I think we will at least be able to do something that will push the industry forward. Uh, so these are some of the initiatives that we have done. Congratulations, Roshan. That seems like a Herculean task to be able to talk to various departments within the government and then figure out where you fit in and figure out a future for this uh, sector. Uh, Malvika, just want to bring you in here. We've heard from Roshan. I mean, it's not really a top-down approach because Roshan himself is from the sector. He's been talking to people on the ground. Uh, Ima has been. But from your side, what is it? that you need? What are the priority interventions and support that you need from the authorities, from the government in order to, to continue doing the work that you do and also continuing to deal with any future shocks of waves that may come in? Uh, well, we our, our event, our main event, the Kolkata Fest Literary Meet is under the Ministry of Culture because it takes place at Victoria Memorial, which is run by the Ministry of Culture. Uh, we have found a happy way of keeping them quite uninterested. Earlier in the conversation, someone mentioned most of the big events take place in Delhi, Bombay and Bangalore. So possibly that is the prevailing mood. So we don't really fall into that spotlight. So it's a happy place to be in that sense. But I really liked what Roshan said about uh, a single window. You know, it is it is painful. And in these times, it is especially painful because your your team is actually going to three, four government offices when you're actually being told that the situation is quite unsafe. So a single window would be a fantastic thing that uh, any government could implement for events. Uh, other than that, I just uh, think that uh, governments should make so this is across every every uh, segment of society they should just be vaccinating empowering and uh, what should i say making people more courageous to go out and do things because uh, we need to live with this uh, with this uh, situation for a few years 
So it's not only about events. Uh, as I said, in another life, I am a sports marketing person as well. So we had this international chess tournament where we had grad masters coming from six countries as well as uh, Vishwanathan Anand is the, the ambassador of this event and mentor of the young Indians who play in it. So we put some, it, it was again held at the National Library, which is another iconic uh, place in Kolkata and under the Ministry of Culture as it happens. So they just gave us the space and they said, you do what you have to with it. So we had to put up the, you know, the, the temperature screeners, the sanitizers, which was fine. And we had to take all the responsibility of testing the players every 36 hours and uh, looking at uh, COVID certificates. Now, the tricky thing, and this is somewhere there is a place where the government needs to vaccinate younger people quickly because... At the chess is a tournament which have, is a sport which has a lot of young audiences, and none of them were vaccinated. So to it, it, it seemed very risky to see you know 12, 13, 14 year olds in the audience. This was in November, and we were running the fest, the, the tournament with 50% audience. So I think the government has to do things right on a broader level. I can't think of anything very specific to, uh, you know, an event eventually reflects the, the, the health of, a, of society. We can't be in a vacuum. So whatever good happens in uh, the government does by way of vaccinations, uh, medical facilities, it will reflect on an event. So I think it's, it's, uh, an event actually feeds off what the government does what the government should be doing as its job. Thank you, Malvika. So we've, we've so far looked at how the sector has been directly impacted, what uh, associations that represent the sector have been doing, what kind of representations they've been making to the government, and also a good sense of how governments have been responding across India and UK with respect to the Omicron variant, uh, but also across the last three waves. Uh, I'd like to bring us all in to talk a little bit about what are the innovations happening in the space. You know, we, we just briefly across uh, the last few minutes also mentioned that whatever said it none, it feels like you're left to yourself as well uh, as, as, as a sector. So you have to look out for your own growth and innovations and, uh, uh, you know, become a part of that growth. So at this point, I'd love to bring Deepak in. And, and Deepak, if you could just give us a sense of uh, what have you seen um, as innovative solutions and best practices that have emerged uh, in the last two years, um, how many of them are feasible in the long run? What kind of learnings uh, have emerged from COVID, particularly in relation to the formats of, uh, of things that we are presenting, which may or may not be in person or live? So I think it's a mix of it. Like um, digital uh, has seen a new shape, okay? And has seen a, anybody who's... Uh, um, who were little there um, and, and then chosen to be more there has seen a different value. And same goes to events. Uh, so usage of digital tech, virtual uh, content, whoever has used all of this well the last two years has for sure scaled this, which was not an opportunity sitting before. Okay, so, so that, is, that is one part. Secondly, um, I'm saying let's, if we see, um, and, and this is here to stay, so I'm saying in a, in a festival format, uh, the screen will become important, how much and how you're showcasing rightly on that screen. Okay, so, so that's, that's for sure there. Now, how uh, it's, it's, I do like in my um, avatar of uh, a festival promoter, um, I've, I've done multi, of like a, for example, a kids festival called Windmill. Now, in a, in a, how have we been able to, so we've taken Windmill virtually, Okay, so so what has happened on virtually while uh, and and so we will continuously do virtual event a virtual windmill because it's seen the audience how uh, kids are getting involved in the tech world and finally getting entertained there and this this will stay so so and it's not going anywhere it has got this parallel market to the physical event what it was yeah say for example we build a festival called global South Indian music movement it's in Telugu Malayalam Kannad it's a it's a festival of all these four languages how they've all come together and it is content creation with a lot of musicians coming and creating music virtually now so again this would have not happened uh, otherwise yeah so so what i'm 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 putting a point on is um, 
anybody who's added um, additional content and investment to digital that will add on to the business in parallel okay so so that's where the perspective is thank you tom would love to hear from you about what's been happening in the uk if there are any certain best practices and innovations that you could point us to sure i mean i, I think there was some festivals that um did move online they sort of attempted to do online iterations um some were more successful than others i mean some people use the cultural recovery fund that i alluded to earlier as a way of sort of adapting their their practice and their output to sit with that um i'm just thinking there were some events uh i think lost horizons is one that springs to mind that fully embraced the immersive world and sort of created new spaces um, for audiences that were uh, had a lot of interactivity um, within them as well. Um, Glastonbury did last year a smaller session called From Worthy Farm, which was just a tight selection of some artists just playing acoustic sets in the open. So it's fully distanced, um, very safe, very compliant, um, for, you know, very high production values as well. Um, and that was something that fans really liked. And I, I can't remember if it was free of charge or not. Um, so I think there's, there's been that side of things. Um, I do think though everybody is at the point where they're admitting, you know, digital's great and it has all its benefits through accessibility and on some on some fronts. Equally, you know, if you don't have access to technology, if your signal is not good, all that kind of thing, it's not so accessible. But people are clamoring to get back to the live experience, I think. And I, I suspect that's probably the same in India. That's true. I think it seems that innovation is largely emerging in the digital space, but you need the, uh, the, the sort of safety net to even think about uh, thinking creatively amidst all of this risk. So definitely funding helps. Rashmi, can I, can I just come in with some sure. things on that? Yeah. So, sure. so two, three things. One is that I know that two, three companies have now started approaching um, us as EMA and even otherwise to, to come up with a DigiPass, which takes the COVID, uh, you know, protocol at the back end. So that you can see, we we have thrived on uh, a lot of jugaad always, but now in this thing it can't pass. You need to be when you know when people used to talk about the fact of oh there's an event and people have sort of infiltrated from various areas. Somebody's given free passes. You, you know entry is not controlled. But now we will need to become extremely careful about this. I remember that during the first wave in Vegas there was a concert that had taken place where. They tested people on the spot six hours before. After that happened, people attended the concert. They then did contact tracing later. Nobody had got anything. Uh, so I think similar things will happen. And this kind of an initiative is happening in India as well. Uh, there are two, three people we are currently screening to see, uh, because if EMA comes on board, it's obviously going to be almost an endorsement from the industry. So we're screening them to see what's going to happen. The second thing is that, in-person events will have limited audiences who will be completely, you know, socially distanced. There might be, I mean, you've seen people sitting on beds and orbs and all these kind of things that happened last year. But as Veer Das rightly said, he said that my, my ticket for the intimacy, where, where, where I'm selling intimacy and this live thing, the ticket price might go up to 10,000 rupees a person from an average ticket price of say 500 rupees or a thousand rupees where it used to be. And he said, I might then have six cameras shooting and editing something beautifully, which is going online for which a person might be paying a hundred rupees. And I might get, I might get 5,000 people at a hundred rupees and I might get 500 at 10,000, but that's how I'll cover uh, my thing. The, the, the third thing that I really want to say is that, you know, this whole thing, we've been talking to insurance companies, obviously nobody's got this. And I try to tell people and I'd exhort everybody who's currently watching this wherever they are that one insurance that you can get for yourself is to become a part of organizations that are doing this, whether you're part of Artex, because you know the kind of information that you all disseminate, or it's EMA, where, the, I mean, we have gone so often and knocked on various doors, and the only response is, oh, but you know, you're not big enough. But now we are slowly with these new numbers, we are saying, the more we have members, I mean, today, it's 500 premium event agencies, etc. But Imagine if that number was 50,000, which we know for a fact that it is. Now, if it was 50,000 or 100,000, the association will have so much more power that we will be able to actually then impact uh, policy. 
because that is critical. So therefore, the sitting on the sidelines waiting for someone else to do things is not going to work. This is the time for everybody to kind of jump in. I have had a tough time in the last month keeping our members in check because they all actually wanted to go out on dharnas and stuff. And we said, listen, that may not be the best way right now because, you know, uh, and you know, the other day when we were having that chat, Malvika had very rightly said that there has to be a sensitivity. But at the same time, there needs to be a balance that we need to find, which is what I keep trying to, in my role, look for. Uh, the last thing, of course, is that uh, three days ago, I saw a wedding that was happening in the metaverse. And now I'm uh, hoping that very soon we will be seeing concerts that will be happening there, which were happening. Gaming is way ahead of us in technology, which is why smart performers have moved into games to perform. So if you see some of the biggest DJs performed in Fortnite and got millions of people coming in. So it's just that that smart technology sort of is taking things forward. Uh, we genuinely could learn from that. I do believe this is a digital events version 1.0. Um, two weeks ago, we had volumetric projection of one person as a hologram in front of another singer and they were performing together and they could get the feeling that they were physically together. Uh, you know, the I don't know how many of you saw that Japan has developed a screen that will now be able to give you scent. So the more you're able, if all our senses, if, if, if visual, tactile is also being looked at with, with a lot of technology where you, I know it's tough, but, but if you end up getting tactile, smell, visual, oral, then uh, you're almost there. Of course, nobody can uh, provide the, the joy of, you know, the serendipity of meeting somebody in the aisle or, or you know, slapping someone on the back, which is still such a beautiful thing that we have. But I do believe that technology will keep advancing to make these things happen. Thank you, Roshan. And thank you for sharing all of those uh, varied, varied perspectives on how should we move forward. And you're absolutely right. I think Ima, I, I mean, I personally have seen Ima over the last two years really make a dent in thinking about how to represent the sector and how to make the best case. Um, actually, it's, it's, it's a really good time to take some audience questions. There's a question from Roshni Kumar who's asking, so how do we help as individuals who've been in the industry? And this is a question to everyone, Deepak, Tom, Malvika, anybody, Roshan, if you'd like to answer. I, I do believe as an association, I can only say that uh, it's not an association only for companies. We've got tiers of membership and we often tell people saying, come in. Uh, we have a lot of people in various committees who are not running event agencies. So our artist community, uh, commun uh, you know, uh, committee, our uh, festivals committee, our safety committee had individuals who were experts. And if you have that expertise, uh, that's what we really need. So, so please come on board. That's one thing that we would love. So Roshni, that's for you. We'll drop, uh, drop an email to you with the email ID of Ima so you can reach out to them. There's another question that's come in from Varun and anybody who would like to respond to Roshni as well, that would be great. Varun says that uh, since we can't ever be sure, even in the best of circumstances that a festival can go forward, given permissions, weather, logistics, etc., what contingency planning goes into the work? Um, and he gives an, like, that is, if we cancel, we will. So if, if anybody would like to share any kind of contingency planning that festivals should have in place, uh, not just given everything that's going on at the moment, but just generally that you could share with uh, Varun Anand, that would be great. I can come in two, three points in this. One is um, largely uh, every venue is agreed nowadays uh, to ensure that if there is a case like this, then postponement can happen. And earlier they were... Uh, not sure about it, but now the agreements are capturing that very well. Okay. Second is artist, while you're signing an artist agreement, ensure that all the artists are signed, that the dates gets pushed, the monies won't come back. So these are the two large costs. And uh, if these two are taken care, I think everything else is, is uh, fine enough to manage. Yeah. Thanks, Tita. Tom, is there anything that you'd like to share with us on this? Um, no, just, just a second. What Deepak said, actually, um, I, th I think there is an understanding in the sector here. Um, there are things coming which are called causes for abandonment, where you just have to say this this cannot go ahead, but we will carry it, the the engagement over the terms over, and we will honour it at a future date. And I think I think people have been understanding about that. I mean, whether when things fully go back to normal, um, whether that goodwill maintains remains to be seen. I think I think at the moment everybody's you know, willing to work together a lot, whether the bad old ways will sneak back in again, I think remains to be seen. 
Thank you, Tom. I'd also like to, uh, Varun, this is for your benefit. Malvika had raised a couple of points earlier, which I think is relevant to this. One is having a contingency budget for uh, going forward, a stronger contingency budget than you've ever had before to account for certain expenses that occur uh, in between uh, uh, editions. And the second would be, I think, to make a stronger case in, in front of your sponsor at the very least, uh, because having them on board and understanding that this situation may happen again uh, will give you a little bit of a wiggle room. We'll also put some of these uh, recommendations together as we've heard in the session. The final question that I have for all of you before we close is what are your recommendations uh, to festivals uh, or to uh, running them and for audiences on how to uh, you know, uh, attend festivals safely? Is there any appeal that you'd like to um, you know, make here both to the audience community as well as the festival sector? So this is open to everyone. Uh, and I'd, I'd love for any, every, everybody to come in with something here. Maybe starting with Malvika. Uh, well, uh, as an event manager, I would like to now think time has come for us to be a little more agile and perhaps look at splitting festivals, rethinking the way we, you know, we, we look at January for our festival. So maybe thinking of a monsoon edit, which is the worst idea logistically, but moving indoors and, uh, you know, just having one aspect of the festival go to another part of the year so that you don't feel that the whole thing is gone. You can move things. Maybe I'm just, I'm just thinking on my feet. The other thing is to, you know, the, we have to rethink the way we plan festivals. I used to invite international authors 16 months ahead. I think that is just gone, that that period has just gone or isn't, that, that isn't relevant anymore. So now we have to create festivals which can be put up and uh, mounted in say six, seven weeks, you know, because uh, otherwise you're just you're kind of setting yourself up for uh, the situation we just faced right now. So if things, if another wave comes, I think, uh, you know, installment based festivals and festivals which are lighter to mount would be the way forward. Thank you for that, Malvika. And I, and I just want to sort of connect that to one of the points that I think Deepak had raised earlier and briefly, Tom, as well, that uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of work that will happen within the region, within the country, because uh, there is a lot more to lose when you are, in, at least right now, given the constrained scenarios that we're working in, to work with international artists or so artists who have to travel far away, especially if insurance uh, you know, structures don't allow for artist cancellations as, as one of the aspects to take into account. So well, actually, when we were working on uh, building festivals from India, we did a small bit of research around thinking about how audiences are going to change over the next two years. And one very interesting insight that came through is that in the next two years, many of your audience are, audiences are going to be either regional uh, or within the nation, within the country. Um, and that was correlates to, I think, what both Deepak and Tom were talking about, that are, there's it's, it's the space has opened up for a lot of local talent to uh, come up and, and, you know, have that space and voice in front of the audience that they want to. So maybe that's, that's another thing to think about that really look deeper into what do you have locally uh, as talent uh, as well. Deepak, would you like to give your recommendation? Yeah, to so, so mix of it, I think all of it have to be going parallelly. You can't focus on one of it and say multi-city Malika said, it's a great idea. All festivals can be divided into formats in a smaller city, smaller, uh, like a, uh, a social nation we are doing in a, a mall format at in Delhi. Um, windmill bus, we are creating, uh, windmill festival, kids festival, we create into a bus, which is now traveling to 20 cities. Okay, so so that's, that's one part. Uh, for sure, think India. India is larger, don't think. Um, uh, no need to make, get international artists and so on. Keep it tight. Uh, uh, keep, keep the costs tight. I think that's that's where the cost has become important. Earlier we used to in our festivals we used to sometimes go go like okay let's do it let's do it let's do it. But yeah, keep it keep it tight. ATL cost is gone. Reduce your ATL expenses and spend more time on digital. I think that's uh, make artists as partners. Roshan is a very big believer on it. Make artists as partners in your festivals and IBs and that's that's where get somehow government support get a brand support in the beginning, think regional while you're saying um, uh, as regional is again a future. So I think that's that's where it is. And audience for sure, audience doesn't care. I think audience will come if we do the festivals. So don't get worried and do the festival. 
that's a positive note to end on deepak tom yeah i i think that i for audiences i'd second what deepak said is uh, connect with your audiences give, give them loyalty um give them reason to be, believe in you and you know just simple things like if you do have to cancel or postpone try and encourage people to not ask for a refund that can be a real make or break a, a lot of festivals experience a lot of goodwill for people just saying no keep the price of the ticket i'll, I'll wait a year um i think from the festival side it's about working together it's about helping each other out it's sharing ideas but it's also coming together as a as a bigger mass to sort of you know do the lobbying campaign for the support that kind of thing because i mean whether that's been lobbying at government level in the uk or just supporting people who've been hit really hard times it's been really encouraging to see what's come out and it has really helped people through thank you tom russian um couple of things i think one is uh, somebody said last year that uh, live events for theater digital events are broadcast learn how to broadcast um because it's all going to be about content the second thing is just like there was revenge tourism and revenge shopping as deepak has said there will be revenge eventing people will step out to do it i've seen it i've seen it everywhere people want to come out physically so they will come build communities because the big thesis that is currently talking about web3 and crypto i know it sounds a lot of jargon but the truth of it at the center at the bottom is it's the democratization of the creator economy which basically means that tomorrow you won't need anyone to do a festival if you can build a 100000 people community where everybody gives you 50 rupees right that's all you need but can you build it can you do that can you make these you know the the hypothesis of the 1000 great fans the loyal fans that you know you need um i think that is something people should really work on and uh, you know i i completely agree with what tom said that you know instead of refunds ask people to fund they will fund people who are loyalists will fund they like ownership they like being a part of things at that level so so learn from this digital economy because there is a lot to pick up there this decentralized autonomous organization which is becoming the whole conversation on daos I think it will happen in our event industry as well. Thank you so much, Roshan. I mean, it's really amazing to hear all of you uh, end on such a positive note. Uh, we've, we've had a couple of very difficult months, but to hear you say that there is a way forward, and that way forward actually is is sounding the most fantastic way forward, which is inclusive, which is agile, uh, which is uh, you know standing up for yourself, coming together and saying, "Hey, we have a voice." doesn't matter the size and scale of what we do and how we operate but we need to have a voice and we need to make that representation um thank you for all of this and bringing all of this in together uh just a, a shout out to uh all four of you for doing such amazing work that you are doing and not you know despite everything that's going on around you you're just just out there making the work that you do you know creating a uh, culture for all of us and creating a space that allows people even within various phases of the pandemic to use arts and culture to be able to heal um and and you have been taking that forward for us so thank you so much for it for the audience just a couple of points um look at ema sign up support uh become a member if you can if you are in a position um at british council and at arts and culture resources india we also run a festivals community this is on uh, an independent app called dara and we'll also be running this community of festivals from so please do uh, join you can reach any of us across our text festivals from india and um, um with i'd like to invite shankulita chakraborty the head of arts west india to give you thanks shankulita over to you sure thanks rashmi um so thank you everyone for joining us uh, at today's festivals connection event um and a big thank you to all our panelists and to rashmi for this very engaging session um bridge council has been uh, working very closely with the festival sector for the last few years and through our various festivals for the future programs we've been able to connect with a wide range of stakeholders from the sector and hear from the sector experts about the needs and challenges and the way ahead in the sector so this really informs our program planning and it helps us in designing these um 
sector responsive project. So we really value conversations like the one that we had today. And um, I hope everyone who has joined us today found the session to be useful as well. Um, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank our panelists again, Deepak Chaudhary, Malvika Banerjee, Roshan Abbas, and Rich Council's very own Tom Sweet and Jonathan Kennedy uh, for sharing these useful insights and information uh, with all of us today. Um, and to our audience, thank you again for taking time to join us. Um, your feedback uh, is uh, very valuable for us. So do share your thoughts on today's session and um, any suggestion you may have for the future Festival Connection sessions. Uh, you can write to info at artex.co uh, or you can leave a comment on the uh, YouTube stream on which uh, the session is currently being stream streamed on. Um, and um, last, but of course not the least, uh, really the hands and hearts behind this session, the team at uh, Arts and Cultural Resources India and at Bridge Council as well for bringing this session to fruition. Uh, to close, we have a short video to introduce uh, the Festivals from India program that uh, Jonathan and Rashmi has talked about, uh, which is uh, set to launch in just a few weeks uh, time from now. So, and all uh, the festival organizers and managers in, in our audience today, like please don't forget to register your festival at the platform. And uh, thank you and uh, good evening. See you again, hopefully, I mean, soon. Over to you, Ashwin.